This is part three of lecture one, covering chapter one, the human body and orientation. Uh, in this video, we're going to be covering section three, the requirements for life. <clears throat> so all organisms, all living things have a certain set of requirements. Uh, and these requirements are also the defining features of living organisms. So non-living creatures, well, sorry, there are no non-living creatures. Non-living material does not need or meet these requirements, or at least not all of them. Uh, and all living organisms do need these requirements and display these characteristics uh, in order to carry out life. <clears throat> So some of the necessary, well, the necessary functions for life include maintaining boundaries, movement, responsiveness, digestion, metabolism, excretion, reproduction, and growth. And we're going to go through each of these uh, requirements, explain what they mean, what they are, and then discuss the organ systems in the human body that are responsible for maintaining these functions and carrying out these functions. So boundaries in living creatures are important. Uh, boundaries separate an internal environment from an external environment. Uh, and we have these boundaries going down to the molecular level. So within cells, the organelles have outer and inner boundaries that differentiate their internal environment from the rest of the cell. Similarly, cells have an outer membrane called the plasma membrane that separates the inside of the cell from the rest of the environment. And if you're talking about a single celled organism, it's separating the inside of the organism itself, the cell from the outside environment. In the case of human beings where we're multi-celled organisms, the cell membrane or plasma membrane separates the inside of the cell from the rest of the organism's body, from the extracellular space. Similarly, at the level of the entire multicellular human body, the skin or the integumentary system is going to separate the inside of the organism from the outside environment. So again, maintaining these boundaries are important when those boundaries are not maintained, organisms die. And similarly, when an organism does finally die, uh, its ability to maintain those boundaries breaks down and those boundaries dissolve and internal and external environment mix. Um, so maintaining boundaries is very important for maintaining life. Movement is important. Uh, movement is a function of all living things, even organisms that don't uh, move their entire bodies. So stationary organisms like plants or uh, certain aquatic organisms that are sedentary, there is still movement within their bodies. Uh, even plants are able to move fluids and other materials within their structures. And humans uh, and other animals have to move their entire bodies to get from place to place, primarily to uh, get food, interact with other organisms of their species, and so on and so forth. So movement is important. And in humans, uh, the primary mechanism for movement are muscles. So we have the uh, various types of muscles in our body that we'll be getting into more detail with in later chapters. Uh, but the ones that you're probably most familiar with are the skeletal muscles. These are the muscles that you control through uh, uh, conscious effort. And these are the muscles that are engaged when you are moving your arms and legs, when you're walking, uh, breathing. Um, and this movement, uh, these muscles allow movement of the entire body. Uh, we also have smooth muscle that is found in many of our internal organs that allows them to move and uh, adjust their size and, and density. Uh, and cardiac muscle, which is associated with the heart that allows for the movement of blood through the circulatory system. Um, the ability of cells to move at the cellular level, or at least uh, as far as muscles are concerned, is called contractility. So one of the key 
features of muscle cells, whether they are skeletal, cardiac, or smooth, is that they're able to contract. Uh, so essentially they can go from an elongated, stretched out shape to a more um, uh, truncated, shortened state. And that process is called contraction. And so the ability of those cells to move is their contractility. Uh, and again, we'll be getting into much more detail with these properties of muscle uh, anatomy and physiology in later chapters this semester. Responsiveness is the ability of organisms to uh, respond to their environment. So that is a key feature of all living things. They're able to sense what are called stimuli uh, in the environment and react to them. In many cases in animals, this involves movement. So we, we uh, detect stimuli in our in environment and we either move towards or away from them. <clears throat> but there are other kinds of responsiveness as, as well. Um, our ability to taste, smell, see, our senses are part of our responsiveness. Um, and so we also have physiological responses. Uh, breathing is, is able to change due to conditions both outside and inside the body. Um, as I mentioned before, moving towards or away from things uh, for safety or preservation. So for instance, when something hurts, you tend to withdraw or move away from it. Uh, that, that's a withdrawal reflex and that protects the body from harm and the organism from uh, potential lethal damage. Digestion is the process by which uh, uh, organisms break down and ingest food. Uh, so we require food for many metabolic purposes. Uh, we need food for energy. So the food that we eat gives our bodies energy and we use that energy to sustain our, our cells and therefore our, li uh, our, our living bodies. And our cells also need material. They need physical stuff to replace, uh, replace things when they get broken down and worn out and to make other cells. Uh, and we get both energy and material from food. And in order to use that food, we first need to break it down into its individual molecular components before our body can then absorb and use that material. So digestion is that process. Metabolism is a term that I've mentioned. Uh, metabolism is the total collection of all of the chemical reactions that occur within the body. So all living things rely on chemical reactions to sustain life. These chemical reactions are going to be used to extract energy from food. They're going to be used to break down molecules and build new molecules. Uh, so this is one of the processes that that is critical to survival. Um, and all living things have some form of metabolism, uh, some form of some set of chemical reactions that occur within each cell uh, and within their bodies to sustain their life from single celled organisms all the way up to complex multicellular organisms like human beings. Excretion refers to the removal of wastes. So uh, one of the, the side effects of metabolism is that waste products are created. So some examples would be carbon dioxide uh, during cellular respiration. I'm sure you fam you're familiar with the idea that when we breathe, we are taking oxygen out of the air and then we exhale uh, carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is a waste process product of the processes in metabolism. Uh, another kind of waste material is called urea. This is produced through the breakdown of proteins. Um, this is another side effect of, of certain metabolic processes. So the, this waste material is produced by our cells and needs to be removed from the body through the process of excretion. Uh, additionally, our digestive system does not absorb everything in the food that we eat. There's some material that we don't digest uh, and that material 
passes through the digestive system and is excreted in the form of feces. So we need a way to get rid of waste material that our body produces or can't use, and that's excretion. Uh, living things need to reproduce. Many uh, single-celled organisms and microscopic organisms reproduce asexually, meaning that one organism is capable of producing its own offspring. But animals, uh, most animals, uh, and especially uh, ma vertebrates, mammals like uh, human beings, need to reproduce sexually. Uh, and so this involves the production of uh, cells called gametes, reproductive cells, and the combining of the male and female gametes to form a fertilized egg or zygote that can then grow into a new individual. So the reproduction is a, is a process through which organisms make more of themselves. Uh, and so that's a key feature of life. All living things come from other living things. Uh, they, they cannot uh, uh, be generated spontaneously. So we need some form of reproduction in order to, to uh, make more organisms. And in the case of humans, that reproductive process is a sexual reproductive process. Similarly, when a new organism is created, it begins as a single cell. And so uh, that cell needs to grow, divide, multiply to grow larger and become a multicellular organism. Um, to become viable at birth. And then after birth, the, the newborn needs to then develop into an adult form. Uh, and this involves growth and development. Uh, also in the adult, there are tissues and organs that will grow periodically. Um, uh, and growth is also needed to repair damage. So when we are injured, cells and tissue in our body is destroyed. And um, uh, uh, in order to replace those, the remaining cells need to grow in order to, to create more cells and fix the, the damage. So as I mentioned, humans are multicellular. Uh, so each of the cells needs to carry out all of those functions that we've just described in order to survive. Uh, and then all of those cells working together ultimately function as a, a single living organism. So the organ systems in our body that we're going to be discussing shortly each play a role to service the cells in our body and keep them alive, to, to carry out one of those processes that I've mentioned here, either uh, maintaining boundaries, moving material uh, or the organism, responding to the environment, digestion, metabolism, excretion, reproduction, and growth. So there are 11 organ systems that work together uh, to maintain the life of the human being. And this is a uh, very generalized diagram that shows how some of these organ systems work together. This is not uh, exhaustive, but just to give you an example, the digestive system is going to take food in, break it down, and digest it into molecular components that can then be absorbed. So those molecular uh, materials that the body will use are called nutrients. So nutrients are absorbed from the digestive system. Non-digested material will, be, uh, will pass through and be excreted as feces. The nutrients that are absorbed will pass into the circulatory system, into the blood, where they can be transported through the body and reach the cells. Uh, so they will actually be secreted from the, the circulatory system, from the bloodstream into the interstitial fluid, which is a liquid that surrounds all of the cells in our body. Uh, and then the cells in various tissues, whether it's mis muscle or nervous or an epithelial tissue, can then absorb those nutrients uh, and use them for metabolism. Uh, similarly, in the lungs, the respiratory system, when we inhale, oxygen from the atmosphere is absorbed into the blood and carbon dioxide uh, is released from the blood, secreted out or excreted out 
into the, the air in the lungs to be exhaled and removed from the body. The absorbed oxygen is also going to travel through the circulatory system uh, to the, the cells in our tissue. The oxygen and nutrients will be used to fuel metabolism and things like carbon dioxide and metabolic wastes will be excreted into the blood, transported through the circulatory system to the kidneys where the blood is filtered and waste material is extracted. Uh, materials that the body wants to hold on to will be reabsorbed back into the blood and the waste will be uh, excreted in the form of urine, stored in the urinary bladder and then eventually eliminated from the body. So this is an example of four, uh, four organ systems, the digestive system, the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, and the urinary system all working together. And these systems are all encased by the integumentary system. So that would be the skin primarily um, that separates the outside of the organism from the inside of the organism. So actually, uh, that would be five systems that we're showing here. Now, uh, I'm going to give you an overview of all 11 organ systems in the body. We're not going to cover all of these in this first semester, um, but we will be covering uh, about, about half of them. So the integumentary system makes up the outer covering of the body. And this uh, is mostly made up of skin, but also the structures found within the skin, things like our na nails, hair, um, sweat glands. And this forms a, a basically a water and airtight seal that keeps the internal environment of our body separate from the external environment. It also contains a number of sensory receptors that allow us to respond and gain information from our environment. Uh, and the sweat and oil glands help maintain uh, internal conditions like temperature and fluid. The respiratory system is made up of the lungs, trachea, bronchi, uh, larynx, pharynx, and nasal cavity. This organ system is responsible for supplying the, the body with oxygen and removing carbon dioxide. Uh, and this is going to interact with the circulatory system. So it's the blood in the circulatory system that will pick up oxygen from the lungs and release carbon dioxide into the, into the lungs. The skeletal system is made up of mineralized structures called bones. And where the bones come together, where two different bones meet, that is a joint. Uh, and joints are the point of articulation or movement within the skeleton for the most part. There are some joints that, that do not move, but any, any time you have movement in the body, um, it's going to occur at a, a joint. So the skeletal system is going to provide support. It allows our bodies to uh, maintain their structure against the pull of gravity. If we did not have bones, we would be uh, basically shapeless blobs of, of tissue, but the skeleton provides structure. Uh, it also provides protection, mainly in the form of the, the rib cage surrounding our thoracic organs and some of our upper abdominal organs, and the skull, which protects the cranial cavity, the brain, and, um, uh, and, and I suppose the uh, spinal column also protects the spinal cord. So it provides protection to the um, most important organs in our body, the lungs, the heart, the brain, the brain stem. Um, it also plays a role in the circulatory system because the bone marrow, the, the part within the bones called marrow is going to produce red blood cells as well, sorry, uh, produce blood cells, both red blood cells and white blood cells. The muscular system is composed of skeletal muscles. And again, these are the muscles that we are able to move consciously. Uh, so when you lift your arm or move your legs, 
that is because m skeletal muscles are contracting. Uh, and the skeletal muscle system and the skeleton work together to form this movement. So the, the skeleton um, provides a structure, a rigid structure for the skeletal muscles to pull against. Um, without the skeleton, the skeletal muscles would not be able to do a whole lot. Um, there are organisms, invertebrates, that have muscles that can pull against themselves, other muscles. Um, but uh, uh, in, in vertebrates and in humans, we require the skeleton for our skeletal muscles to function. They pull against the hard bone to create movement. Uh, we also have other muscles involved in other organ systems, but when we refer to the muscular system, we're primarily referring to skeletal muscles. The nervous system and endocrine system are both regulatory systems. So they maintain and regulate many of the processes within our body. The nervous system is a fast acting system. It can respond very quickly to stimuli. Um, and the fastest responses tend to be reflexive. So we don't consciously control them. Uh, they're, they're actions that our body respond to without really thinking. Uh, however, there are many processes in our body that do require conscious effort, and those are going to be processed through the brain, which acts as a sort of central uh, processing unit. So stimuli from throughout the body, uh, bringing in information from the external environment and internal conditions within the body, uh, that information is sent to the brain, it's processed, and then responses are sent out down the, the spinal cord, out through the nerves, and the body can respond. Uh, and so the nervous system can stimulate the action of muscles, the contraction of muscles, or the secretion of, of chemicals and hormones from glands. The other regulatory system is the endocrine system, which is made up of a series of organs throughout the body, shown here. So the pineal gland, pituitary gland, thymus, Adrenal, uh, uh, adrenal glands, pancreas, and gonads. Uh, these secrete chemicals called hormones into the bloodstream that then circulate through the body. And these chemicals will interact with different cells in our body, causing them to change their behavior. So endocrine system responses tend to be longer, slower responses and more long-term effects. Uh, and so the endocrine system regulates things like metabolic activity, uh, growth and development, reproduction, and the use of nutrients by the body, where the nervous system tends to um, act in more short-term responses and affects muscles, but can also influence the, the endocrine system, causing uh, uh, certain glands to secrete hormones. The cardiovascular system is composed of the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood within the vessels. And the primary function of the circulatory system is movement or transport. It transports blood throughout the body, and blood acts as a transport medium for things like nutrients, oxygen, waste material, and hormones, which I just mentioned. Um, so it, it acts to move things around the body, collecting uh, uh, wastes in the organs responsible for cleaning waste out of the body, distributing nutrients and oxygen to the various tissues so that they can use those for metabolism. And that transport is driven by the heart, which is a cardiac muscle structure. Uh, it is the only organ in the body made up of cardiac muscle. And when the heart contracts, it generates uh, pressure that forces blood through the, uh, through the blood vessels. It also uh, plays a role in distributing fluid, um, so maintaining water balance within the body and distributing temperature. Since water can absorb heat, it can move heat around the body as well. The lymphatic system, uh, sometimes associated with the immune system, 
uh, is closely related to the circulatory system. So it's made up of a network of vessels called lymphatic vessels or lymphatics. Um, these are used for transport as well. So in the circulatory system, some of the, the, the fluid portion of the blood at the tissue level will leak out. That's how the, the tissues in our body receive nutrients from the blood. Uh, the fluid in the blood will leak into the uh, extracellular space, becoming what's called interstitial fluid. And that fluid will then be picked up by the lymphatic vessels and directed back towards the circulatory system. So the fluid will then return to the blood. So that's one function of the lymphatic system. In addition, the lymphatic system uh, is going to act as a um, sort of a, a, a waypoint for cells in the immune system called lymphocytes. These are white blood cells that uh, play a very important role in our immune response, the ability of our bodies to recognize foreign material and foreign microorganisms and mount a response to, to um, prevent infection and uh, heal toxicity or, or eliminate toxins. So that's the lymphatic system. The digestive system is responsible for processing food. So food is consumed through the oral cavity where it's broken down into um, a kind of a, a paste that then passes into the stomach and the small intestines where chemical digestion breaks that those small food particles down into their molecular components. Uh, and within the small intestines, those chemical components, those nutrients are absorbed into the body. Um, the liver and uh, pancreas, which is not shown here because it's behind the stomach, play a role in production of digestive enzymes, uh, chemicals that will actually break the food down. And then any undigested material will pass through the large intestine or colon um, before being excreted from the body through the anus. Uh, the urinary system or renal system is composed of the kidneys, ureters, and urinary bladder. Uh, this organ system is responsible for removing wastes, metabolic wastes from the bloodstream. So as I mentioned, the nutrients from the digest, uh, from digested food and oxygen from the lungs are picked up by the blood and transported to tissues with throughout the body. The cells in those tissues will use the nutrients and oxygen to carry out their metabolism and in the process create waste material uh, that the body can't use and can become toxic. Uh, so that's going to be picked up by the blood and transported to the kidneys that have specialized structures that filter out the waste material and create urine, which is a liquid material that contains the waste. The urine is then transported through the ureter to the urinary bladder for storage and then excreted out of the body through the urethra. So the urinary system is uh, a system that removes waste from, from the body. And then finally, we have the reproductive system, which is responsible for reproduction. Um, so the reproductive system consists of the primary reproductive organs, the gonads, so in males, the testes, and in females, the, the um, ovaries. Uh, these organs create the gametes or reproductive cells, so sperm in the testes and ovum or egg cells in the ovaries. Uh, the secondary reproductive structures, the, uh, the penis, the vagina, and the uterus are for uh, bringing those gametes together. So sperm are deposited in the vagina, migrate into the uterus uh, where they can fertilize eggs, and then the fertilized egg or zygote will develop within the uterus into uh, a viable um, uh, infant at birth. And then the females also have uh, mammary glands. Well, technically both males and females have mammary glands, but only uh, in the females with certain hormones do the mammary glands become active and develop 
into milk producing uh, organs that can sustain a newborn. Um, so that actually brings up another thing. The, the testes and ovaries are part of the endocrine system uh, that we mentioned before because they produce hormones, specifically the, the sex hormones, uh, testosterone in males, estrogen and um, uh, uh, estradiol in, in females, uh, or sorry, progesterone, uh, estrogen and progesterone in females. Uh, and these hormones are going to create um, differences in the development of the male and female gross anatomy um, during, uh, uh, during puberty, during maturation. So those are the 11 organ systems of the body and the general roles that they play in maintaining uh, the, the functions of, of life in human beings. Uh, and as we go through this semester, we're going to be looking at uh, a number of these organ systems in more detail. So we're going to be looking at the integumentary system, the skeletal system, the muscular system, the nervous system, and I believe that's it. The other organ systems are going to be covered in the second semester uh, in anatomy and physiology part two. So those are the, the systems we're going to be looking at. Integumentary, skeletal, muscular, and nervous systems. So <clears throat> Humans, like any organism, need a number of factors in order to survive. Uh, so these are things that our bodies need at the most basic level to continue survival, to prevent death. These are nutrients that we talked about. This is, these are materials that we get from our food that are used for energy and raw material, raw building material. We need oxygen uh, to carry out our cellular metabolism, which we extract from the air through the lungs, through the respiratory system. We need water, which is brought in to our body through the digestive system and distributed uh, through the various cells, tissues, interstitial fluid by the circulatory system, by blood. We need to maintain a normal body temperature, which is carried out by many systems in the body. So our general cellular metabolism creates heat and then our circulatory system can redistribute that heat so that our body is evenly heated for the most part. Uh, and then our integumentary system can uh, release heat, uh, radiate it out into the environment if we're too hot. And then we also need appropriate atmospheric pressure. So this is critical for absorbing oxygen and uh, just maintaining survival. If we don't have enough air pressure, um, the air is too thin, we're not able to, to get oxygen, and our cells will begin to, to break down. And if we have too much pressure, uh, like we would experience under very deep ocean conditions, then uh, our bodies can be, be crushed under that, that pressure. So nutrients are the chemical uh, materials that make up our food, and we break that food down in the digestive system into molecular components. Uh, and these are then absorbed by the digestive system and distributed through the body in the circulatory system. So these include the four major biological molecules that we will be discussing in detail in chapter two, the carbohydrates, proteins, uh, fats or lipids, um, not listed here are the nucleic acids. We do need those, uh, but we don't use them for energy. And then minerals and vitamins. So, min, uh, so the carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and nucleic acids are all biological molecules, meaning they are produced only in living things. Minerals and vitamins are non-living uh, nutrients. So these are not produced by living organisms. They can be found in the environment or uh, or in the bodies of, of other organisms, but they're, they're not biological molecules. Um, 
And these minerals and vitamins we typically only need in small amounts, but they're critical for carrying out very important chemical reactions. So typically carbohydrates are used as energy for the body. Proteins are primarily used for structure. And fats are used for long-term energy storage as well as structure. And again, we'll be getting into more detail with the, the chemistry of nutrients when we get into uh, chapter two. And then also, again, in the second part of anatomy and physiology, when you discuss the digestive system and <clears throat> metabolism. Oxygen is required. Again, this is needed for uh, what's called cellular respiration. This is a process where the food molecules primarily carbohydrates, but also uh, under certain conditions, proteins and fats are broken down by the cells and energy is released. So oxygen is necessary for this process. Uh, and the human body can only survive for a few minutes without oxygen before the cells begin to die. Uh, they can't carry out cellular respiration. They're not able to generate energy from food and without that energy, they begin to break down. So we need a constant supply of oxygen. Water, uh, this is the most abundant chemical in the body. Uh, this is the um, probably one of the most important nutrients that, that, uh, that humans need. Uh, all of our cells are composed of mostly water and the tissues that the cells make up uh, have what's called interstitial fluid, liquid that surrounds all of the cells. And then our blood is also mostly water. So the interstitial fluid, the, the material that makes up the cells in our blood, all is mostly water. Uh, and so water is the most abundant material in our body. And we need to maintain a consistent amount of water for all of those chemical reactions and other processes that we've discussed to occur uh, properly. So if we become, uh, uh, if we lose too much water, we become dehydrated and some of our metabolic functions begin to break down. If we have too much water, similarly, our metabolic processes begin to break down uh, and that can be dangerous as well. Our body temperature needs to be maintained at a constant level. So these chemical reactions that are part of our metabolism uh, are most efficient at body temperature. So human body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, which is the equivalent to about 98, uh, 97 to 98 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we're primarily going to be using the, the Celsius or centigrade scale in this class because uh, we use the standard units of measurement in, in science related topics, which anatomy and physiology is. So 37 degrees Celsius is the temperature that our body needs to be maintained at in order for the chemical reactions of, of metabolism to occur uh, at the right speed and prevent the, uh, the chemicals that, that are uh, mediating these reactions from breaking down. Uh, particularly proteins. So we'll talk about uh, the temperature sensitivity of proteins in chapter two. And then we also need the appropriate atmospheric pressure. So again, uh, we need a particular range of pressure for there to be enough oxygen in the air for our bodies to absorb it and carry out gas exchange. If atmospheric pressure is too low, we aren't able to get enough oxygen in our bodies and if pressure is too high, then other gases like nitrogen, which is the most abundant gas in the atmosphere, begin to be absorbed by the blood, and that can cause problems. So those are the major um, uh, processes of life that uh, all living things carry out uh, and all living things need to survive, and the requirements of the human body and the, the 11 major organ systems and how they relate to those necessities.